I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 17th of September, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. It is an absolutely gorgeous day. The weather is actually not that hot, so I'm feeling this beautiful breeze, and it's just a wonderful day out for a walk. But the, the vitamin D generating energy in the atmosphere is high, so I am really like bright and blown out from just how bright it is. Like you step outside and you're like, ah, oh, it's such a pleasant day, and you're like, wow, whoa, it's crazy. So it's a bright one, but it's uh, it is really nice. So I'm enjoying this walk, and we're going to be answering a viewer question. We're just just one viewer question today because it's kind of a big one, uh, and we're going to get to that. But it's all about raising small children here in uh, Nicaragua uh, when you're an expat, of course. So we're going to get to that right after the bump. took a break from walking so I could read my phone and give you the full uh, message that was put onto the community. This is from Jennifer M6533 from two days ago, so I'm a little bit slow, in, but it takes a little bit to, to respond to these, but by the time you're seeing this, it's only been three days. Hi, I'm interested in knowing what it would be like to live in Nicaragua with a young child. I have a 19-month-old toddler, so that's coming up on two years, and my primary concern is dealing with scorpions and other dangerous wildlife. Currently live in California, where we never have to deal with anything besides black widow spiders, which are pretty easy to avoid. I'm also curious about the education system and is what is available in the way of extracurricular activities like music lessons, sports, arts, etc. How much does it cost to hire a nanny or are there other good childcare options? Lastly, I'm also a single mom and wondering if it would cause any issues, cultural or otherwise, for him or myself, him being her toddler. I'm currently looking for a cooler location. I'm currently looking for a cooler location since I'm partially looking to escape the heat here in California. Thank you so much for this channel. Well, awesome, Jennifer. That's a lot of stuff. We're going to do my best to cover that as someone who uh, has had small children here when I first lived here in 2015. My youngest was uh, very close in age, a little bit at least half a year older, uh, about a year older, I think. I think she, I feel like she was three uh, when we were here in 25th. Yeah, she would have been three. So slightly older, but by the time you get here, it wouldn't be that far off from what my experience was with my youngest daughter in 2015. And then we've been raising them abroad and here in Nicaragua for many years. So uh, currently she is 12. And so I believe she had just turned 10 when we returned. Uh, so we were here when she was three and then returned when she had just turned 10 and have been here ever since. So let's get to your question. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to address all the different things that are in this question. The first one and the, the thing that she said is that uh, is of her primary concern is dangerous animals in Nicaragua. And I think if you watch my channel, you really get a good sense that there are not very many dangerous animals or wildlife here in Nicaragua. That's really not a very big concern. People who live here really aren't worried about it. That said, there are scorpions. Any place that is warm is going to have scorpions and especially California. So I don't know where she is in California that she's not worried about scorpions. But that is a huge concern. One of the reasons that my family, other than not wanting to, but one of the reasons that my family cannot live in California is because of the risk of scorpions. So that my family is able to live here and not in California because of the scorpions tells you a little bit about the situation. Now, of course, if you're on the northern edge of California, right against Oregon, there may be very few. If you're in the south near Arizona, they basically run the show. So it all depends where you are. Uh, California is an extremely large place. Something that's important to note about about scorpions is that scorpions in the United States tend to be very dangerous. They have a lot of venom. The scorpions that are here in Nicaragua tend to be relatively safe. They have very little venom. That doesn't make them not dangerous. If you're allergic to them, that could be a problem. But in general, scorpions here are not something seen as a danger, whereas in the United States they are. We have different species of scorpions and it changes that picture dramatically. So while we do have them here and it is common to see them from time to time, in three years of living here, I once saw one uh, in San Juan del Sur in 2015 in a building that had not been used for several months or maybe a couple of years and there was one and we just jumped on it that was the end of it uh, while living in uh, laborio in the middle of the city in an older structure uh, we saw one outside on the street that I killed while it was outside, like I made an effort to go out and kill it. Uh, and I believe we saw one inside the house and I don't think we have seen any since we've been living in Sutiava. Not that there aren't any, of course there are. We didn't move so far as to eliminate scorpions from the ecosystem. Uh, the point really is simply that there aren't really that many. At most we see one 
more than it's, it's more than a year in between sightings of a scorpion of real scorpions we have also seen about as many whip tail scorpions um, or, or uh, tailless scorpions. These are not actually scorpions and are in no way dangerous. So they're scary looking. And if you're wondering what they are and you have no idea, you have no re frame of reference for it, I will assume you have seen Harry Potter. If not, go watch the Harry Potter movies, but first read the books because they're better than the movies and they fill in a lot of things. The movies are fantastic though, but go watch the movies and in the, uh, the, the, the I believe it's in episode three uh, where um, um, Mondungus is, uh, not Mondungus, but, um, anyway, they're, they're doing the Defense Against the Art, uh, Dark Arts class, and he takes out this scary looking kind of spidery creature, and he's, and he's doing terrible, uh, unspeakable curses on it, and, um, that is a, a whiptail scorpion. They're completely safe to hold. They're things you actually want in your house from a they do good things standpoint. They eat other things. They keep other things you don't want away. They, the worst they can do is scratch you, uh, if you were to actually mess with one. They have no interest in humans but they look like a terrifying scorpion. They have no stinger, they're nothing like that. Those we also have. So other than looking terrifying, they're no big deal. Um, overall, we find that we have fewer spiders here than we had anywhere we've ever lived in the United States. Not that there's few, simply fewer. The United States does have a lot of spiders. So here we have a fair number of spiders, but nothing absolutely crazy. We do have a lot of wolf spiders, again, not very dangerous, not the kind of thing you worry about, nothing like a black widow. We do get uh, tarantulas here. Um, not something we see very often, but this comes up at a, a very uh, interesting moment because the first one we've seen on our property, it was outside, uh, was here in Sutiava and probably on the day that this question was asked. Now it was only this big because tarantulas can come from really, really tiny up to huge, right? We don't have huge ones here. We don't have really tiny ones either. We have these ones that are like this big and they can get up to like, uh, depending on the, the species. Um, the one that we had was quite small, but you could tell it was a tarantula from the way it walked. And so we killed that, which may not have been necessary, but my kids were losing their minds. And when we lived in La Borio, which again, older structures, uh, much drier part of town, doesn't have the grass, we, we encountered a number of uh, tarantula carcasses uh, in places where things had killed them uh, outside, never anywhere near our house. But again, tarantulas aren't really dangerous. They, they can bite you, they, but they, they're really not a risk. It's not like a scorpion. So while they're nasty, it's I don't know anyone um, other than our friend April who encountered some in her closet, uh, who's ever encountered a tarantula. And I don't know anyone who's ever had a nasty run in with one. Just, ah, there's a, there's a tarantula there. That's creepy. Um, but no one has an experience of like, I got bit by one or it caused a health issue or anything like that. Scorpions are potentially risky. If you have a very small child or you have a very elderly or sickly person, then scorpions can start to uh, pose a little bit of a, of a risk. Um, but in general here, scorpions are just uh, they're not that abundant in your housing, especially if you're keeping it clean and uh, if you do anything like air condition, like that kind of stuff, you're just not going to make um, your house conducive to a scorpion. And pretty much as long as you aren't leaving uh, shoes on the floor and, you know, you always shake them out, which is you have to do that in the United States, too. Right. People don't because it's you can get away with it 99 percent of the time. But it's good practice. Um, it, when we lived in Texas, you always had to do that. Right. There are risk when we lived in Texas of scorpions that were dangerous was wildly higher than here, right? A thousand times uh, as dangerous. So uh, so that's things that we're used to coming from the United States. Here, yeah, you do want to shake out your shoes. You do want to pull your beds away from the wall, but that's good practice anywhere, right? Or at least anywhere warm. Um, so nothing special to Nicaragua. And on the off chance that you do end up encountering in a very close and intimate way a, a scorpion here, the chances that it's going to do anything more than simply hurt when it stings you, very, very low. So in general, all those creepy crawly things, that's actually a reason to come to Nicaragua. We don't have very many insects or other creatures like that that are risky. We don't have very many dangerous uh, snakes or anything like that. And of course, we're not snake free. This is not Europe, right? Europe has nothing scary, basically. Um, bears, right? Bears are seriously scary. We don't have those. Um, but, uh, you know, are there poisonous snakes here? Yes, but only a tiny fraction of what you're used to anywhere in the US, right? I lived in New York, I lived in the East Coast, I've lived in Texas, I spent a lot of time in California, all those places, many, many more dangerous snakes than here. And uh, insects in the United States, way more abundant, 
you're constantly dealing with uh, spiders that are dangerous, scorpions that are more dangerous, um, centipedes and lots of other things that may exist here, but we encountered them constantly in the United States and no one really talks about it here. And one of the things that, that really shows just how dramatic this is, and we've talked about this in some other episodes, uh, if you go back, um, is that in the United States, we tend to lock up our houses, not just against intruders, that certainly is a major driving factor, but we carefully close off uh, our houses with screens and ceiling windows and doors that seal all the way around to keep insects out. And it's a great idea because there's little tiny flies. There's like, I mean, I've got some gnats here that are flying around me as I do the show. But um, all those little bugs that will get into your house, if you're in the United States and you don't have screens on your windows, your house is going to be full of bugs fast. Like, that's just how it is. When you come to Nicaragua or you go to Europe, you find that a huge amount of people, including us, don't use screens on our windows. And we don't close our windows at night, ever. And during the day, and our day means like all but four hours, because we, we between the different people in the house, we only sleep uh, with everyone asleep. Out, there's always a security guard, but if people in the house, there's only about a four hour window in which there isn't someone awake. And in many days, it's only two hours. As long as someone is awake in the house, we have the doors wide open, three doors to different sides of the house. So if there's something that wants to enter our house, it's just gonna come in. It doesn't matter if it's a tiny, tiny little bug or a frog or a rat or a cat or a person. They can just walk in anywhere. So because of that, that that really shows, and we're not unique in doing this, right? We're not like, wow, look at these crazy people leave the house open. No, 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 this is how people live here, right? You can do this in the middle of the city, you do this in the middle of the country, people leave things open. Maybe not their doors. You don't tend to leave your doors open too much unless you're somewhere really nearby, like looking out it, um, but, but people do leave everything open and wildlife could just come and go inside your house normally under normal circumstances. And there's so little wildlife, it's not really a problem. Honestly, the biggest thing we've ever had issues with are things like frogs, iguanas, and cats. The iguanas, as soon as they know you're there, they run away, they don't care. Frogs are a little bit more of a problem because like, how do you get rid of them without hurting them? Um, you know, did we have a snake in the house? Yes, I did a video on that just recently, but it was a king snake, a very friendly snake, not of any risk whatsoever. They're not aggressive. They don't go after people. They're not venomous. They're, they're what you want nearby to your house because they keep other snakes away. They eat things you don't like, like tarantulas, I think, and more dangerous snakes. Not that we have many, but what little bit we have is a food source for king snakes. So in general, we have very little problem with insects, with dangerous animals, with, with creepy crawlies and critters, anything like that. That is an extremely low risk. So, we, and it, if you just take basic precautions, like, what is that is? Like keeping your bed away from the wall, making sure to shake things out, things that you're supposed to do all the time, no matter where you live, you're going to be in great shape. Scorpions aren't looking to get into contact with humans. Don't make it uh, tempting for them, and they won't be tempted to, to come visit you. Now, the next question is about education. What are the education options here? Well, this is gonna be uh, a big range of things depending on what it is you're looking for. If you're looking to use the public education system, it's famously not very good and it's going to be completely in Spanish, but you have no requirement to use that. So that's something I would generally avoid. Um, it's, it's simply not a set of resources that are going to make sense for you in most circumstances as an expat raising your child here. There are lots of private schools ranging from uh, out here in the country where I live. There are many private schools. Uh, we're talking like elementary and, and high school here. Uh, just on this road that I'm standing on right now, it's really easy to come out here and have a choice of many private schools. Some will be all in Spanish. Some will be a mix of Spanish and English. Some might even be all English. I don't know if there's any in this particular region that are all English, but there's definitely mixed schools. There's ones that focus on the young years, there's ones that focus on the older years, there's ones that are just for girls, ones that are mixed. Like you have a, a pretty big variety just in this relatively rural area that I'm in. It looks more rural than uh, or it, than it really is because of where I'm standing, just because I was trying to get out of the, the bright sunlight to do the video, but it, it is a pretty remote area. There's not a huge population and there's still a lot of education options if you wanted to go that route. What a lot of people also do is consider going homeschooling or online schooling 
uh, which will give you a lot more flexibility. Of course, that uses more of your resources. You don't have somewhere to send your children during the day, but presumably you're going to be working from home or not working, depending on your situation. So given that, it may make sense to keep your children or your child at home with you. Uh, so you spend more time together. You can oversee their education. You can make sure they're getting exactly the education that you want um, and, and you know, use whatever uh, resources are available. For us, we come from Texas. So Texas allows us to do uh, homeschooling, but they also provide us essentially unlimited resources if we wanted to do an online school officially through the Texas uh, public education system. So we can go back and forth as we deem fit using resources that are completely free from the state of Texas. And California, I assume, has similar resources, probably even more, being a bigger and richer place. Uh, and one that is focused much more heavily on education. Texas is not a place known for education in any way whatsoever. That's not really true. They're actually really famous for being absolutely horrendous in their education at every level, right? From pre-K through graduate level, it is world famous for how bad it is. So that that's not the claim of fame you really want to have, but that's, that, you know, but even there, they have a lot of resources. If it's something you want, they're going to help you um, do that. Plus there's lots of private homeschooling resources. So if you're looking for uh, online classes designed for, for homeschoolers, or you're looking for support groups, or you're looking for anything like that, those options are out there. Those are normally paid, whereas the state ones are normally free. Now, specifically, you were asking more about extracurricular activities. So that is not a thing that's super popular here. And I'm not sure why it is in the United States, other than schools are seen as daycares, and they're trying to do anything to justify the lack of education in the school. So extracurriculars tend to be a place where they point to to fill time and keep kids from having time to develop naturally and do things that would be good for them. I'm a big opponent of the majority of extracurricular activities. I think they're very detrimental to children um, in general. Of course, the idea is great. We want them to take an interest and do things and meet other kids. Fantastic. And there is some of that here. There is some in the States, but I would very carefully define what your end goals are in extracurricular education um, for anyone, right? Not just because you're moving, but for anyone who's looking at that. If the reason is you want your kids to have um, the best access to resources in uh, college for like in the United States, university in the United States, then they tend to look at extracurriculars very heavily. So you need something. If you, uh, if you are feeling that you need that for education, then consider that you're not gonna be in the United States. And so you have an option to simply educate better rather than using extracurriculars to fill in the gaps from a bad education system. You can simply do a good education program however you feel like doing it. And then you don't need those extracurriculars to fill in gaps. You can avoid the gaps in the first place. If you're looking to do it for socialization, typically extracurriculars aren't very good for that. That's not actually something they serve uh, a mechanism to fill. It's something that people say, but if you're gonna go out and do sports, for example, I was on the swim team in high school, the amount of socialization that came with that was practically zero. But what it did do was fill my time with school activities so I didn't have time to socialize. So it was actually an anti-social activity, as is most school. One of the things that people often point to with homeschooling is, well, well how are they gonna learn to socialize? The question should be not how are homeschoolers going to learn to socialize, should be how should public school children learn to socialize given that their days are completely filled with antisocial activities where they're not allowed to socialize with other kids, where they're not given healthy interactions with adults, they're given more of a prison type structure. And that is one of the most antisocial things that you can do for children. So by homeschooling or by coming to another country like this, you actually are giving a starting point of being probably ahead in socialization rather than behind. It is a marketing tactic from the American public school system to try to pretend that somehow one of the most antisocial activities in the human experience is somehow necessary for socialization. That is completely crap, right? That is not true in any way whatsoever. If you have kids in high school, think about what their, their experience is like. It is so not socialized. They don't have time to socialize. They don't have time to just sit and, and have uh, relationships with other people, whether it's just friends or someone you, you video game with, or you go out and just d explore the countryside with, or learning something you're interested in. Those things don't really exist because your time is filled uh, with time where you're not allowed to interact with other students. One of the things I hated about being in school when I was in school is the inability to socialize, right? Specifically, I would constantly get in trouble because I wanted to socialize and that was not allowed. 
right? I'm sure that has improved some. I say that, but I think it's actually gotten worse as I'm saying it. Like famously, they've done so much to crack down on socialization in school and to minimize that uh, because it's not seen as a, as, a, as a benefit. So when looking for extracurricular, all of that is to say, what is your goal in having extracurricular activities? Is it simply to have a babysitting service, which is what is the majority in the United States, then you have lots of options to, to find ways to keep your kids safe and occupied. You really don't need the same level of, of babysitting. Of course, a 19 month old can never be left on their own to their own devices no matter what. As children grow up here, uh, this is a much safer environment than anywhere in the United States. And so the, the idea that you have to have adults around at every moment all day long is not the same. You don't have to have kids in a structured uh, protective services kind of situation. And we also don't have those situations specifically be dangerous for children. A key reason that uh, schools are seen as a negative in the United States is they're incredibly dangerous, not just from the obvious news making uh, activities, but also because there are just, um, you know, the, uh, many teachers and a great number of other students tend to be very uh, uh, physically aggressive or emotionally aggressive towards other students. And it's, it can be a very hostile uh, location where there is very few opportunities for people who are really in a position of concern for any given student to step in and oversee them. You don't have that here. You have a situation where you can easily keep your children in a safe, nurturing environment throughout their childhood years. So the need to look for environments to keep them safe uh, is, is not nearly the same. They're, they're starting from a position of being safe almost all of the time rather than being uh, vulnerable almost all of the time. So starting with far better socialization and far better safety may change your perspective on what you need just as a starting point. But we should go farther because presumably at least most people believe that a primary goal of extracurricular activities is to provide a more well-rounded experience. And you gave some examples, music and art and uh, sports and things like that can be important for anyone. All those things can be really good and they may be things that you need to have. Those are things you can address in multiple ways. Now, traditionally, those are all things you should be getting during school, not as an extracurricular. I realize that many American schools are now taking those things that used to be seen as uh, uh, normal education and pushing them off to extracurricular so that they can charge for them. But the rest of the world, that's not happening. So those are not extracurriculars here necessarily. But if you're uh, homeschooling or you're going to a private school that may not have those resources, absolutely, you have access to, uh, I mean, this is a music uh, country, right? People really uh, are into live music and in performance. So finding a music teacher is incredibly easy. Uh, you can, um, and especially because it's very affordable, getting private lessons in anything that you want uh, is, is very, very easy. And we have several friends who are full-time music educators here. So we personally know just in our little area, uh, many people that we could call on and, and be like, oh, our kids would like music classes and you name it, they'll teach it, right? So that's, and when I was young in the United States, I had to get private lessons to be able to get music education as well uh, because I wanted to start younger than the school would allow. Uh, and so uh, I had a private music teacher and that's always how it was and I had to do it instead because extracurricular activities meant I couldn't get art or music and those things I had to do them separately uh, so here the same thing and and those things are better if you're looking for uh, a resume or or whatever for university um, you'll find that uh, regular school is seen as uh, the minimum level and extracurriculars are seen as the step up but doing things on your own is the layer above that and then doing them professionally then doing them professionally is yet another layer above that. So if you want to appeal to a university program or you simply want to provide a better uh, rounding of education for your children or child in this case, avoiding extracurricular activities and going to community activities or, or full-blown adult education activities because extracurricular means it's still part of the just as minimal skirting by just enough for kids but when you do real like oh we're taking music classes which i did we could take art classes which I did. I'm not an artist in any way whatsoever, but it was interesting and I learned a lot from taking private classes in art. Um, I, I did uh, programming education, right? Because no school, no matter what they tell you, no school is actually teaching that. Everyone I know has kids who have taken programming classes in school and it actually made them dumber because they didn't teach programming, but they lied about what programming was so that they could pretend they were giving a class that sounded like it was valuable. And at the end of the day, they didn't even learn what programming was, but go around saying that they've taken programming classes. It's a little bit saying like, oh, I took classes and learned how to drive really well. And then finding out that the student who took driving classes can't even identify what a car is or where the highway is, right? Like it's so 
far removed. So those are things that, that can be very bad. Extracurricular sounds good Well, I went to chess club, but if you want to play chess, don't go to a chess club at school where it's just a bunch of other kids looking to fill their time after school. Go out to the community and start playing chess against the guys in the park or find a, a real club of people who are actually interested in it, not an extracurricular activity where it's kind of half, it's just kind of halfway there, right? And so universities are going to look far better on that, and it's going to give far more of an education. Um, some examples that I did in my life was I joined the Kodak Camera Club and went and took classes for photography with professionals as a teenager rather than doing them in school. I took I took professional, uh, professional music lessons, I took professional art lessons, um, and all those things were, were vastly more valuable. Um, I spent time becoming an athlete, which you'd never believe now, but uh, I was an athlete when I was a teenager. Both in school and on my own, I competed with adults in, in full-blown sports, not just uh, special student-only sports. Those things were incredibly valuable. Now, of course, we're talking about a toddler, so you need things with, with little kids, and, and those are things you're gonna be able to find as they get older, uh, whatever is appropriate, you're gonna be able to find some amount of it here. It's gonna be very different, right? If you wanna play baseball, that's gonna be easy, like super easy. You wanna play soccer, super easy. You wanna play American football, possible, but much harder, right? That's it, there's, I don't know of any American football club here in Leon, but in Managua, there's several. So it depends, um, it depends on the activity that you're looking to do. Uh, if you wanna to learn to play violin, you're gonna find that very difficult. There are very few violinists here in the country, but if you wanna find someone to play saxophone, it's gonna be very easy. You wanna play guitar or piano, very easy. These are instruments that people use all the time, whereas there are very few orchestras. There's very few orchestras, uh, so there's, there's not many opportunities for people to pursue things like orchestral violin or whatever um, uh, professionally. And so just the, the supply chain for that is different. But other things like saxophone or trumpet are used all the time. So getting classes, getting instruments, uh, getting opportunities to play with others, very, very easy. So uh, you may have to have some amount of adjustment, but overall the opportunities to get uh, classes and things that are uh, beyond school are very, very easy. And as someone who homeschools with their kids, one of the things that's challenging for us is there's no strict definition between school and extracurricular and professional activities. Uh, my kids do things in their homeschool classes that most places would consider extracurricular, but they do them at a level that is very, very different, very, uh, they do it with adults. They do things that would, would fall into a different category. And so much like I did when I was a kid, um, when I was 13, uh, well, really starting when I was nine, I learned to program. I learned to actually program. By the time I was 13, I was working as a programmer, uh, as an intern. And by the time I was uh, 18, I had a full-time gig. That's what I did. And, and had a lot of experience and had already managed people, right? and had done like big projects. I was doing projects as a teenager that most professional developers as adults don't do. Most people will go their careers and not get to where I was as a teenager from the type of work that I did. And that's not to say, oh wow, Scott did this amazing. No, the point is that by taking the time to start and learn and do those things, when I was young, it gave me the opportunities to do those things very, very early because the barrier to getting into them is not necessarily that high, especially in today's world. And when you're young, you have the ability to learn very quickly and you have the freedom to spend time going out and learning to do some of those things. And one of those things that I learned when I was very young was video production, something that I now do many hours per day and is a big part of my life. Those are things that I started learning when I was about 12 years old. And because I did it with professional tools and the same things that businesses were using and used the same hardware and treated it like I would in a business instead of like I would in a school, I learned far more, much more quickly while costing less. And it took me to a different point in my career where I was able to treat things professionally rather than treating them as a school subject where you don't learn enough to take it to the next level, you have to go through many more steps in between. Uh, those kinds of things really are available to you. And those are, those are true if you live in the United States, but they're also true here. The thing that makes them even more attractive here is that the number of things that are able to be taught in school is lower, but the barrier to getting into other types of classes or other types of learning experiences is also much lower. And so if you wanna take music lessons, for example, that may be very unaffordable in the United States, it may be very cheap here, if you, uh, but you don't have the opportunity to simply do it in school in many cases. Most of the schools here do have marching bands, that is a given. Everybody does marching band, it is a huge part of life here. 
But beyond that, many of the classes that you would wish that you would take in high school, there aren't a lot of those extra options, but your availability of getting those, whether it's online or local, incredibly easy and, and simple to address. One of the questions was, what does it cost to hire a nanny? And the answer for hiring anyone here, as long as you don't need them to speak English, is it's very affordable. Once you need people to speak English, the cost is going to skyrocket by generally an additional six to $700 per month. But if you're looking for a nanny who speaks Spanish, which is normally what you would want, especially as you likely will want a child who is uh, living here to grow up hearing Spanish and correct Spanish, not like my children hearing my Spanish, which is pretty rough, um, but hearing hearing native Spanish is a huge benefit. With a, with a 19 month old, you have an opportunity for them to grow up bilingually uh, with fluency in multiple languages. And so having a nanny that does that, and my children had the advantage of having multiple nannies who were Spanish first speakers. They all spoke English, but they spoke Spanish at home. And so they heard a lot of Spanish when they were very young before we ended up moving to Spanish speaking countries. So they've had a lot of exposure, even though a lot of it was not very formal. They also now take Spanish classes as well. They also use Duolingo, but the combination has been very good, uh, but they could have benefited much more had they been in an environment like this with someone at home that spoke Spanish full time, always right so normally uh you can hire a lot of positions here starting at and this is the salary number about 200 a month but you need to pad that there's a lot of overhead and expenses that go just like with anywhere so assume it's much closer to 300 dollars per month for most starting positions those are minimum wage jobs uh if you're going to get something like a nanny you probably want someone with a little bit more experience someone who's a little bit more uh um professional or trained or responsible for sure uh depending if they're just someone helping you around the house maybe not uh but if it's someone who's going to be alone with your children probably but you don't need a lot of specialty knowledge you don't need a lot of specialty skills there's a load of people who are able to do this and you would easily be able to find a nanny who may also cook and clean or do other things around the house to help you out so you're going to be looking a little bit above 300 a month in in final compensation much more like 350 maybe pushing 400 however you can mitigate some of that by having and this could be very beneficial with a nanny having someone who lives with you so finding a home with enough space for a nanny to be able to live with you which is incredible incredibly normal here. There's so many housing options that will do that um, at very low cost uh, that that may make sense. And then um, if the nanny is then eating in your house and getting so room and board is included, you're not going to get below that, you know, almost $300 a month total number, but they can be living incredibly well while getting paid that that amount. Um, and it's a it's often a very good combination where they get to live in a very nice house, they get to have access to television and internet and things that they may not be able to afford at home or is much more limited, uh, and you're feeding them, which does cost you, but is not super expensive when you're already feeding yourself. So you can mix that into your budget. It's, it's, not, like, it's not like doubling your budget, right? It's, it's much lower. And if they're helping with the shopping and the cooking, then it may even approach break even. It, they will pay for themselves quite a bit, not entirely, but quite a bit by doing that. And so that process may make it much more affordable. And with a nanny, that can easily make sense. For us, we have a live-in chef. A lot of the same things happen. Uh, she doesn't stay all the time, but she stays most of the week. And that gives us a lot of comfort that we have someone who's always home with the kids, someone that they've known for a long time, someone who's responsible for, for cooking. She doesn't do the cleaning outside of the kitchen, uh, but she oversees staff that does cook outside the kitchen, but she's always there. And that flexibility is a really big deal for us and for her having a nice place that she can live and access to the TV and internet and all those things is a big deal. I have no idea why everyone honks as they go by because obviously I'm recording and I'm not gonna step out into the road while I'm talking and yet everyone feels compelled to do it. So a nanny is, is almost certainly a very affordable, very easy thing. And you could consider getting someone who functions as a nanny and as a teacher uh, and having basically a private nanny slash tutor with, or governess, I guess is what you would often call that. That is an option. It's gonna cost a little bit more, but it's not gonna cost a lot more. Teachers often make very close to minimum wage and are treated very badly in many situations. So even getting as a teacher for example, I know teachers who have worked in expensive parts of the country, full-time teachers with many years of experience who speak and teach English on top of being fully trained teachers with university training, and they're only making around $200 a month 
that's pretty rough. Now, about 300 after all the overhead and stuff because they're, they're getting all their taxes paid, but that's very bad. And they have to often provide supplies at that. They're living terribly. They don't get to live at the school. If you pay similarly, pay $20, $30, $40 a month more, don't make them provide supplies, feed them, let them live in your house. You easily will be able to find a trained teacher who will just walk out of the school system uh, and come be a live-in teacher nanny for you. And, and that could be a wonderful experience where you're getting the best of many things. And then they can teach at whatever pace They're, you're getting an official education through the education system. There's just, there's a lot that can be said for that. So that could be, could be really fantastic. Now you mentioned the heat moving out of California because it's so hot. So be aware, Nicaragua is a very hot country. It is mild. And I know that to Americans, those things sound like they have to not go together, but they can. This is a country where the weather doesn't change. So wherever you are in the country, I'm here in Leon, which is one of the hottest parts. It is warm all the time. We're in the 90s. It's not super humid, but it's not dry either. So when we say it's in the 90s, it feels like it's in the 90s, but it's that way all year round. There is no exception to it. At night, obviously the temperature drops at night. So people who live here, year round, no matter what people on the channel tell you, no matter what claims Americans want to make because they all want to belittle the Nicaraguan experience to some degree, the people who live here are used to the heat. They've adapt to it, adapted to it their entire lives. They understand that they're leaning towards the warm side of things. They know that it's a warm experience, but they don't go around worrying about how hot it is day to day. They do not need air conditioning for normal life. They don't want air conditioning for normal life. Air conditioning would be expensive. Uh, even if they had it, it's really cold, you know, if you're gonna use it in any meaningful way. And that means when you step outside, then it's really warm. They know that by keeping things mild and even, that that's what gives them the living experience that allows them to wear long sleeves and jeans even when it's 95 degrees and not be sweating in many circumstances. If you're gonna be working hard, of course you are, but I'd be sweating if I was doing that in shorts and a t-shirt in New York too. So it's it has nothing to do with that, it's that you're physically exerting your yourself. People are warmer. You are more likely to sweat, right? Humans who grow up in 95 degrees do not find it exactly the same as what humans find who grow up in 75 degrees, but they adjust to it far more than people understand. And they will find 85 degrees to be cold, not super cold, but cold. And they do not need air conditioning for sleeping at night. And in many cases, they don't even need fans. In some cases, they don't even need windows, right? The, the amount that this is a comfortable temperature for people who grow up with this being the temperature all the time, or people who've been here for a long time, is hard to really understand for Americans who are normally going through big shifts in temperature and always have access to air conditioning, you never adapt to the outside temperature. So a mild climate like this is never really very well understood. But that said, it is warm. And this part of the country is the warmest. Leon and Chinandega are the warmest. And you see me out here doing this all the time. And I'm from New York. So for me, this is very warm, but I have adapted quite a bit. And I don't go out and say, wow, what a hot day. I can't take it. I go out and say, oh, this is on the warm side, but that's about it. Uh, going out to dinner at night, we don't need to worry about the temperature in most circumstances. Uh, sleeping at night, I don't need air conditioning really ever, even out here. And if we go to Managua, that just a little bit cooler, those few degrees, we really notice. We're like, wow, it is so nice. If we go up into the mountains, it's cold even for us, even though it's in the high 70s, maybe in the low 80s, uh, but it's it's so much different than what we're used to day to day. And suddenly even I'm like, I want jeans, I want, I want a heavier shirt, like, or I want to go out dancing, and then I can be in shorts or whatever, but I can really dance and I don't have to worry about warming up at all. It's fantastic. So if you're looking at Nicaragua, be aware, it is a warm, warm, warm country, but it is mild. Every part of the country has even temperatures year round. Uh, if you're looking out here in the West, very warm. If you're looking at Managua, it's nearly as warm, but a little bit cooler. If you're looking up in the mountains, you do drop quite a bit. So Esteli, uh, Hinotega, Matagalpa, that region, you can get away from the heat, uh, but you're getting much more remote and a different experience than you're getting down here. I love it up there, so in no way am I disparaging it. But if you're looking at the experience that I show on the show day to day, we're in the West where it's much hotter. But it's hard to really describe how mild it is when the temperature is exactly the same every day of the year. Uh, once you've been here and adjusted to it, most people, once they give it enough time, anyone, I've never had anyone complain about the heat except people who intentionally or unavoidably could not stay long enough to assimilate. They'll say they assimilated, they'll say they're used to it, but they're, they're not here for the requisite two to three months that is absolutely necessary for the human body to fully uh, start acclimating to a new uh, temperature. Uh, and so unless you're doing that, 
you are not in any way, unless people who have told you, anyone tells you it's hot. When I came here and it was 85 degrees years ago, and I came from New York, it felt hot, I was dying. Now it's 95 and I don't feel it's hot because I've assimilated. So I just wanna warn that it's because you're looking for a cooler location than California. Obviously California has Death Valley, we're not that warm, right? But much of California is cooler, but not as mild. California is mild in general, but not this mild. This is truly extreme mildness overall because we're so close to the equator. So it may be a huge benefit for you, but be aware it is warm. Lastly, the question of being a single mother comes up, and the question is, would that potentially create any problems, cultural or otherwise? And I think the easy answer there is absolutely not. That is how everyone is raised here. Single mothers is the assumption that absolutely there are families where the fathers are active, but they are the exception, not the norm. Not an incredible exception, not that you're surprised when it happens, not that you're shocked or you can't find anyone who's like that. No, there's people everywhere where the fathers are present and part of the family unit, but it is not the majority. The way the children are raised here is very, very different. And so single mothers are by far the standard. And in many, many, many cases, it's not even uh, single mothers as you think of it, like yourself, where it'd be you and your children coming to a new place. It is part of a larger family system where the children, uh, the, the small children are being partially raised uh, or even completely raised by grandparents and the single mother uh, piece may not be there uh, with the children, they will reserve the time to raise a child for when it is their grandchild that they are raising. And generation after generation of Nicaraguans have done this. It is a system that works. It allows people who are in their 20s and 30s to focus on being the breadwinners for the family uh, and those that are in their 50s and 60s to focus on spending time at home with small children. It actually makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases. It's very different than what we're used to. And personally, I really treasure uh, the time that I get to spend raising my own children. That is not something I would ever give up. However, I am giving up raising my grandchildren because of the way that the system works uh, to at least some degree. And so that's something that while I find what I have to be something I would never give up, I also wish I didn't have to give up uh, the potential of raising my grandchildren because that is something I would also want, right? I would like both worlds. Instead, I have to pick one or the other like everyone else. Uh, and so that's the way that it is. But the stigmas that you sense around family units and the way that in the United States, there's all these religious structure where they uh, very carefully define that it's only okay to have children in certain ways and raise them in certain ways. And there's all these stigmas and all these uh, social taboos and, and and you're just supposed to follow all these rules that don't necessarily come from anywhere, right? It's just a very societal control mechanism. Here in Latin America, those things do exist, but not around family units. They exist in other areas for sure. There's a lot of uh, religious and Catholic guilt. There's a lot of you have to go in processions and then do music and then like there's things, there's lots of things in society. It's not completely different, but those rigid family structure rules are absolutely out the window here. So, so the relationship that people have with societal norms here is completely different. It's very similar to how the LGBTQ community is treated. In the United States, there have to be protective laws and society is very difficult when it comes to those items. But here in Nicaragua, people are just given the latitude to be who they want to be. And it isn't a big issue that you need to talk about or that needs to be addressed because people have the right to pretty much do what they want to do without being uh, um, seen as a problem in society or being treated differently. And while I'm sure discrimination still exists and problems still exist, I don't want to imply that they do not, of course, but the difference in how those, how uh, less common scenarios are treated as part of uh, society is completely different. The North American uh, uh, societal system is one of extreme conformity. If you don't conform to a predefined set of societal rules, there tends to be societal consequences, even if there aren't legal ones. Uh, and that is extreme. And when you leave the United States, it really becomes apparent. You don't necessarily notice it when you grow up in a place like that because it is something you encounter all the time. But when you go to other countries and see it from the outside, you start to see it as uh, fringe religious zealotry and a societal system that is not considering what is good for society, what is good for the individual, or things that make any sense whatsoever, including in their own religious context, things that would go completely against their own religious beliefs had they studied them. It is simply a society where extreme levels of control, whether at the government level or at a societal level, are the standard. So 
all that said, when coming here as a single mother, uh, not only do you have a system where single mothers are so common that no one would ever think twice about it or even assume anything else, but also you're coming to a situation where if you were to become into a situation where you had uh, a lifestyle or a life situation that was not the norm, it would also not be a problem and people would not uh, think anything particularly strange of it or think less of you or give you any problems or whatever. Like that's just not how it works here. Everybody has to live with what they have. Part of that is in a relatively wealthy society like the United States, people can afford to conform to society for many, many things. Oh, your school says you have to go in for extracurricular meetings at six o'clock at night, things that would only work if you have two parents. If you don't have two parents, you're gonna have to hire someone to, to stay with the other kids and do this thing or whatever. There's a lot of things like that where they, they soft assume or they intentionally assume an ability to do things that force you to conform in order to do something at a different level. There's ways to orchestrate that. Uh, to make it very difficult for single mothers, for example, or single fathers or whatever. Uh, here, no one has lots of financial resources. Very few people do. And so in order to accommodate people, you have to be more flexible. It is a natural thing in a society that is financially more strapped. They can't spend resources playing games with trying to force people uh, into situations that may not be an option for them, right? In the United States, oh, you're a single mother, there's supposedly always an option for you, right? So there, in theory, there's some way out of being a single mother, whether you want it or not is irrelevant, right? That the option exists, society can pressure you to accept that option. Here, that's not reasonable from a purely financial perspective, let alone a societal one. Yes, as a society, it is extremely accepting. It is simply a friendly, uh, nurturing society at the highest level, uh, whereas America is it's one of the most extreme examples of the opposite. So I think in this, this type of regard, this is an area where America is specifically a place you would want to avoid in that scenario more than almost any place outside the Middle East that I can think of worldwide. There's certainly nothing in Latin America or Europe and very unlikely Southeast Asia that would ever, ever come close to giving you the kinds of problems or concerns or societal pressures that you would get in North America. In the Middle East, yes, of course, the Saudi Arabias of the world, uh, the the Kuwaits, the the Bahrains, that area, UAE, you would expect a potential for problems there. Whether they actually do or not, I don't know. But those are areas where I would anticipate something to be able to be on par with the United States and not cause uh, societal alarm. But in most of the world, what this is like in the United States is unthinkable and would never be accepted. And so I think you'll find that you're coming from a place where if you lived anywhere else in the world and someone said, oh, you're thinking about moving to the United States, the things you're concerned about are exactly why they would warn you against it. Ooh, be very careful. A single mom in the United States, ooh, you know, that's like the last place you would go. Nicaragua may not be the first place that you would go, but it's high on the list. This is a place that is uh, very accepting of anyone's uh, social situation, just in general, it's just a very accepting society, but it is also an, a, an extremely highly protective society of women's rights um, and women's safety, like ranked as one of the top in the world, along with like the Nordic countries and the Netherlands. So that's, we, we compete against them and compete in a good way to be the best, right? We're not the best, but we're really close. We're really high on that list, which is a big reason why we wanted to raise our daughters here, uh, because this is a place that takes from the US, which is really bad and moving Moving down, this is uh, mostly doing really well and holding steady, right? We don't have this huge leap going on. That would be great, but um, there's there's only so many countries uh, uh, to leap to uh, in 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 rankings. Um, but while the U.S. is moving backwards, we're doing very well here. So those in general are concerns that I think um, you should look at and say, wow, Nicaragua may be a really excellent choice for those reasons. For the heat thing, maybe not the most excellent choice. It should be okay, but it is warm. Be aware. Now, all that said, as I'm doing this recording, I'm a little bit warm, uh, but I've been out walking around. I'm wearing a hat. Um, I'm from New York. My chef is in the kitchen, which is the warmest part of the house. She's actively cooking. And while actively cooking in jeans and sneakers, I'm in sandals and shorts, uh, she has a tank top on, which would be pretty cool, but she has a long sleeve shirt on over it because she's a little bit chilly and it's a pretty decently warm day. It's not a hot day. Like I said, it's very pleasant, but it's still a warm day and lots of sun and she's in the warm kitchen without a ton of airflow. It's, it's fine, but it's warmer than some of the other rooms and she's completely comfortable with double layers on and jeans and sneakers. So 
like I said, people who grow up here and are used to the temperatures and aren't going in and out of air conditioning are not finding this so warm that they would need air conditioning, right? That's a really important thing to understand when you adapt to this. It's like, oh, why do people think it's so warm? And it's only because we can remember when we did think it was so warm that we understand why people react that way. If you only had the teleport in and this is where you'd always been uh, kind of thing, which is hard to describe, you would be confused as to why people think it's so warm. And that's and a really important way to look at it that people who've never traveled to someplace that's cold, people who've never hung out in air conditioning for long periods of time, uh, really have no idea that this is or why this is perceived as being so warm to those of us who are coming from such colder places, other than, you know, they have some empathy for, oh, you're used to it cold, you know, therefore, you know, we know if people come from here and move to Canada that they're going to feel cold. Like we have that empathy in most, most circumstances, right? Oh, this is so much colder than what you're used to. You'll need more coats than we do. We get it, right? But uh, we often forget that in the opposite, that this is what people are used to and they, uh, only have this kind of arm's length empathy to say, why are you so warm? Like, it's not that hot. Anyway, like and subscribe. I hope that answers your questions. Get down those comments. Let me know what you think about these things and others. More questions you have about education and raising kids here and safety and, and, and different scenarios. I love being able to answer these questions on the show. It gives us good topics. Thank you for giving us, Jennifer, a great topic to talk about today and something that does hit home as we have daughters that have been being raised here for a long time. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Just type that into your browser. It'll go right to me. Don't put in just part of it. Put in the whole thing exactly as I put it on the screen. It goes straight to it. Uh, and uh, you can buy me a coffee there. And that goes a long way to helping support the show and make all of this possible. Uh, as always, Tell your friends and family about the show, share on social media, post it on the Twitters, the Facebooks, all those things of the world. If you're looking for support in moving here, we offer consulting services at info at relocatenicaragua.com. Shoot us an email. We'd be uh, thrilled to talk to you about your potential upcoming move or just private tour that you're looking for of Nicaragua. And I will see all of you tomorrow. <laughs>